A quiet post surfaced on a Japanese message board. It was written by a bedroom developer and it contained a download link to a small indie game. The post received only fleeting attention at first, but over the years, the developer continued to build on his vision. When the game received an English translation, it quickly developed a cult following that has persisted to this day. The game has unsettled players for years with its eerie imagery, dark themes, and horrifying conclusions. This is Yume Nikki, which translates to Dream Diary. The game begins not with fanfare, but quiet introspection. You are Meratsuki, a young, unassuming girl whose eyes remain shut for much of the narrative. Her unassuming apartment is a small space that feels both familiar and isolating. The walls, painted in a muted shade, are left bare. The carpet models a Peruvian pattern. The room contains a television set that receives no broadcast channels, but can be used to play her Famicom, a Japanese counterpart to the Nintendo Entertainment System. There is a bookshelf and a lone desk in the corner where a diary sits. Here, the player saves their progress by recording their dreams in the journal. The world of Madatsuki is small, her hobbies are solitary and introspective. It's a life that appears to be quiet and barren. There is a two-door exit to an external balcony where the sky changes according to the time of day. It is a liminal space, a bridge between Maritsuki's inner world and the external world at large. But even here, in the in-between, there is a palpable sense of detachment However, there remains one other exit from Maratsuki's room, the front door. Yet every attempt to open this door is met with resistance. Maratsuki, for reasons unknown, refuses to venture beyond this threshold. It is here we begin to understand that Maratsuki has shut herself off from the world. The front door is a silent testament to her self-imprisonment. But why? Hikikomori is a Japanese term for individuals who withdraw from social life, seeking extreme isolation and confinement. While the root cause is not always clear, it's suggested that a stressful triggering event can cause extreme social avoidance, and it is often connected to a dysfunctional upbringing, coupled with a traumatic event or events. We come to implicitly understand that Maritsuki is likely a hikikomori, and the question becomes, why? There is only one option left, and it's here that Yume Nikki truly begins. In the early days of indie game development, bedroom developers toiled in near anonymity. These were passionate individuals, crafting digital worlds without the tools and platforms we take for granted today. They were pioneers, navigating uncharted territories, and their work was often personal and experimental. Yet without central repositories, like Itch or Steam, their products were hidden away on forums and websites. The Japanese group ASCII created a series of programs made to encourage and aid the development of role-playing games. These programs were known as RPG makers, which came with map editors, scripting systems, and battle editors. These packages included pre-made characters, events, and worlds, which could be uniquely combined allowing gamers and developers to quickly craft their visions. In essence, it was a bundled canvas and paintbrush for digital storytellers. RPG Maker 2003 was released in Japan just before the beginning of the year. On June 26, 2004, Yume Nikki was shared on 2channel, a Japanese equivalent of 4chan. 
Initial reception of the game was tepid. After its English translation, it developed a cult following, and now it is wildly heralded as the most unique product generated by RPG Maker. Over the years, Yume Nikki evolved as it was incrementally updated, but after its 0.10 release in 2007, the update stopped. A mystery we'll save for later in this video. There isn't a clear story or objective in Yume Nikki. The dream worlds are vast, interconnected, and often bewildering, and the player is tasked with exploration and the difficult job of making meaning where they can. These dreams are not devoid of inhabitants. Strange creatures and characters lurk within, some benign and some unsettling. There is one meaningful way players can change their world and Maratsuki through the use of effects. The game contains 24 different effects, some of which only serve to alter Maratsuki's appearance, while others grant her special abilities. From the ethereal glow of the lamp to the chilling aura of Yuki Ona, these effects are as varied as the dreamscapes they are found in, and they provide some direction, the acquisition of all 24 effects. Some are easily stumbled upon, while others remain hidden, tucked away in obscure corners, or locked behind specific interactions. They can be acquired by touching objects or engaging with characters. Though many of these effects only serve as aesthetic transformations, a few hold the keys to hidden interactions in secret locales. There is the wake-up mechanic, a simple yet profound feature. At any point, players can pinch themselves and return back to Maratsuki's room, a place that becomes increasingly smothering with each new venture. As the dream worlds unfurl, a seemingly endless assault on the senses, the return to her small and drab cubicle feels increasingly suffocating. The only way Maratsuki can leave her room is through sleep. After crawling into bed, she can exit through the front door. This is the Nexus, a point of convergence for the interconnected yet distinct dream worlds. It appears deceptively simple, a circular chamber of 12 unique doors. Each door will take you to a new surface location. The Nexus is an anchor, a constant amidst the ever-shifting tapestry of dreams. It's the starting point, the place of return, and the ever-present reminder of the vastness that awaits. As players delve deeper into Yume Nikki, the Nexus becomes the intersection of memory, emotion, and experience. It becomes the heart of her dream. With the doors presented, the only thing left to do is choose and explore the world within. Welcome to Snow World. Upon entering, the player is enveloped in a blanket of snow. The world feels still, a relatively barren whiteout, broken only by purple coniferous trees and igloos. The landscape is comparatively muted in color tones, a broad expanse of whites, grays, and purples. Maratsuki traverses the landscape, snow crunching under feet. To the southeast are five igloos clustered together. Most stand empty, their interiors dark and quiet, a stark refuge from the relentless snow. One igloo in this cluster stands apart from the rest. Inside, sheltered from the cold, sits a lone figure. This is Kamakurako, colloquially named after the Kamakura Festival, a northern Japanese tradition where little children play inside snow huts. Kamakurako sits unmoving, her eyes closed in what seems like eternal slumber, unresponsive to interaction. She bears a striking resemblance to Maratsuki, asleep and isolated. Her presence in this desolate world raises more questions than answers. 
Could this be a memory of Manatsuki's childhood, a reflection of her past? Nestled among the igloos and snow-laden trees, we find another creature, tall and slender. Further inland, we encounter something else. A pale woman in an icy kimono, covering her blank face with a shrouded hand. This is Yukiona, which translates to Snow Woman. Yukiona is a haunting figure in the folklore of Japan, a specter that roams snow-laden landscapes on chilly winter nights. Her description varies from tale to tale, but she is often referred to as an ethereal woman with flowing hair, her skin as pale as snow, and her eyes possessing a cold, otherworldly glow. Cloaked in a white kimono, she drifts above the snow, leaving no footprints. Sometimes Yukiona is portrayed as a lost soul, the spirit of something that perished in the wilds, mournful and adrift. Early lore categorized this entity as evil, punishing those trapped in snowstorms with her icy breath or freezing them in place. Interacting with this figure, we acquire the Snow Woman effect, which transforms Maratsuki into Yuki Ona herself. In short, it allows Maratsuki to traverse the tundra while she has become a forlorn or malevolent soul. A bed is tucked into a copse of trees to the east. As we learned in the surface world, beds are not mere resting places, they are portals gateways to deeper layers of Maratsuki's subconscious, and this bed is no exception. It's an adventure that we'll have to wait for later. To the south is another solitary igloo, only inside, a pink portal pulses in the ice. By interacting, we are transported to another world, the Pink Sea. Several mesas rise above the churning liquid. We are railroaded into following a narrow path to a red balloon, and interacting with this object, we are teleported to another balloon, this one in the Pink Sea itself. If we travel north, we encounter another balloon, which teleports us to the only other notable island in the world. We see cone-shaped objects dotted around a house. It could be said, this world is representative of a birthday memory, the balloons and the conical-shaped objects that represent party poppers. Within the house resides Ponyko, who is awake yet unresponsive to interaction with Madatsuki. She appears to live in a single room. Players can interact with the light switch in the room, which alters our surroundings. If players interact with the light switch enough times, they are bound to encounter a chance event. Upon turning off the lights, Ponyko will vanish, replaced by Uboa. Uboa's name comes from a Japanese onomatopoeia for a type of scream, likely named after the reaction of players when encountering the creature. The Uboa is a black blob or shadow-like creature with a white oval face, resembling a mix of the Greek comedy and tragedy masks. One eye upturned and one downturned, its mouth a bizarre compromise between a smile and a frown. The room has been slightly altered too, impressionistic faces stamped onto the objects in the room. Interacting with Uboa transports the player to one last world, what's known as Uboa's Trap. The background shows white hills that are groped by a red and black leviathan. Similar to Madatsuki's room on the surface world, there is no escaping Uboa's trap. We are stuck here. Our only exit is to wake from the dream, and we are returned to Madatsuki's room. In a moment of respite, we can record our adventures in the dream journal, preserving the memories of the worlds we've traversed. With that, we return to bed, return to the Nexus, to select another door, behind which a new world waits.
The forest world is thrush with greenery, densely packed trees and sprigs. Nature's embrace is desperate, almost overwhelming. The forest world is a labyrinth. The dense foliage and intertwining paths challenge one's sense of direction, making every step a journey of discovery. There is no floor texture here, and beneath Matatsuki's feet, an ancient Aztec or Paracas-styled monkey drifts. Its art style is reminiscent of the carpet in the waking world. Neon ghost-like entities, known as frog characters, punctuate the clearings in the forest. When Matatsuki reaches out to them, they undergo a transformation, becoming a spectral apparition that hovers above her head. In the northeastern reaches, we encounter a frog. Upon interaction, it bestows the frog effect, and with its use, we are transformed. If we continue to the northeast, we encounter two pillars that look slightly out of place. Interacting with these objects does nothing, but walking between them, we are transported to a deeper location not accessible via the doors in the Nexus. This is how we enter Face Carpet Plaza. The player is immediately met with an unsettling sight. Enclosed by towering walls adorned with metallic spikes, the ground is a vast tapestry of animal-like faces, reminiscent again of the Aztec monkey from the forest world and the carpet from Matatsuki's room. Here we encounter another character, only the second of its kind we've seen so far. Due to their beaked noses and thin, tall bills, they have been nicknamed Torningjin, which translates to bird-human. This one appears different. It's animated, lively. Its eyes are warped pink, as if in a trance and it moves with purpose straight toward Matatsuki. When captured, we are instantly transported to a four-square cell, imprisoned. What message is being conveyed about human interaction? The surreal proportions of these characters, their unpredictable temperaments, some calm, others aggressive, paint a picture of fear and mistrust. When Matatsuki is captured, she awakens in a cell, a recurring theme of confinement that is only escaped by pinching ourselves awake, where we find ourselves back in another cell in the waking world. There's a parallel here with Ponyko from the Pink Sea. She was also pictured as a popular girl, blonde and surrounded by imagery of parties. She was another character who, under certain conditions, was transformed, becoming the menacing Uboa who trapped us in another inescapable realm. These connections, though subtle, hint at a deeper relationship. Could it be that these characters mirror Madatsuki's perception of others, their erratic behavior, their potential for hostility? Could this be the lens through which she views the world, driving her deeper into isolation as a hikikomori? Returning to the face carpet plaza, we can narrowly outrun the enraged Torningjin long enough to encounter a moving geometrical object known as Nenrikido. If we interact quickly enough, the world will shift once more, plunging Maratsuki into the depths of hell. Hell is one of the largest areas in Yume Nikki. It's a sprawling and complex labyrinth that is difficult to navigate. The walls throb between shades of red, the network of corridors and pathways seemingly alive. Even worse, Maratsuki isn't alone in this desolate landscape. The lunatic Torningen are here too. In hell, they are more threatening because they are almost impossible to escape. They wander aimlessly until they are ready to chase down any intruder. Their presence adds to the sense of unease, making navigation of the maze even more challenging. On the eastern side, there's a lone vending machine, where the player can acquire drinks that increase their health. But in the dream world, Maratsuki doesn't take damage. This mechanic might be vestigial, hinting at a game feature that might have been but never came to fruition. Several Nenrikido in Hell 
transfer Maratsuki to back hallways of her dreams, small paths that branch back into other surface worlds. Sometimes these exit into hidden sections that might not be otherwise accessible. Near the center of the hell level is a staircase that bizarrely leads lower to a traditional Japanese Zen garden, indicated by lamps floating above the dark waters. At the northernmost section of this boardwalk, a slender red silhouette stands, presumably eating something spasmodically. When interacting with this creature, we gain the fatten effect, which displays Maratsuki with a considerable gain in weight. It's worth noting that previous versions of Yume Nikki required the character to interact with a mirror to acquire this effect, hinting at Maratsuki's body dysmorphia and self-loathing. The acquisition of this effect concludes our exploration of Hell, a vast labyrinth with haunting imagery and relentless entities. It's a place where memories intertwine with nightmares. Its hidden connection to many other dream worlds seemed to imply a sinister message that hell is always waiting nearby, ready to swallow you up at a moment when you least expect. Stepping into Neon World is like plunging into a digital ocean of color and sound. Every inch of Neon World pulsates with life, but not the kind we're familiar with. The world is awash in a riot of neon colors. Bright pinks, blues, greens, and yellows form intricate patterns. This world may be a reflection of Tokyo districts populated and neon lit. Neon World is teeming with life. Abstract entities, numbering over a hundred, drift and dart around. Their movements are unpredictable and their forms are simple. These abstract beings move with a mind of their own, coexisting in the luminous labyrinth. Some have suggested that the creatures in Neon World represent Rongo Rongo, a system of glyphs discovered on Easter Island. In 1770, the area was annexed during a Spanish expedition, and a treaty was signed by an undisclosed number of indigenous chiefs that marked certain characters in their script. Many of the entities pictured in this world bear some resemblance to these glyphs. As the player travels through the interconnected rooms here, they encounter multicolored statues echoing the Paracas art motifs found elsewhere in Maratsuki's dreams. This recurring theme hints at a connection, a thread that ties her various dreamscapes together, but its significance is yet unknown. To the northwest, a unique creature stalks one of the rooms. The neon parrot is an anthropomorphized bird with a slight hunch strobing through colors as he travels. Interacting with this creature gives Maratsuki the neon effect, which gives her the appearance of a glowing neon sign. Neon World, with its vibrant colors and mysterious entities, is a place where the new meets the old in a surreal kaleidoscope. This is Number World. The walls are lined with machines and decals of zipper-like faces with strange combinations of hands and feet. Similar to the forest world, the floor is transparent, and beneath our feet, a map of the dream world drifts. It's a disorienting recursion, a map of the world within the world. Red numbers dot the floor here. There are narrow corridors leading to large rooms. To the west, there's a bright door that leads to a separate section of what looks like a dormitory. Inside, there are countless beds. Some of these indicate a shape beneath the sheets. 
A single Torningen populates this room. Continuing past the beds, there's a single zipper face spouting blood. Walking to this tile transports Matatsuki to a deeper location known as Guillotine World. Tense, roaring music plays in the darkness, and lunatic Torningen traverse the landscape. A chomping guillotine punctuates the terrain, its blade gleaming ominously. Interacting with the guillotine provides the severed head effect, which is mostly aesthetic. It shrinks the stature and reduces the speed of Matatsuki, and she cannot pinch herself awake because she has no hands. The landscape is dotted with closets, similar to those seen in the dormitory. Most emit a shrill, unsettling cackle upon interaction, but one serves as a portal home to the relative safety of the dormitory. But what does it mean? The juxtaposition of the dormitory and the guillotine world is jarring. Could the Torningen symbolize friends or acquaintances, perhaps from a sleepover or dormitory setting, who morph into aggressors or bullies as night falls, driving Matatsuki to escape to the safety of a cabinet? This casts a shadow over the lone Torningen in the dormitory, hinting at a deeper narrative, one that might demand retribution, a method for which I'm not quite ready to reveal. Afterward, we return to the dresser to be transported to a separate section of hell, only this one is navigable and quite small. At the center of the crossroads is a spirit-like entity that looks familiar. If we pass through the entity, it will turn to face us, and we are confronted with ourselves. This seems to connect our theory about Matatsuki being driven into isolation by bullying at the hands of these Torningen. Then, after an act of retribution, we encounter ourselves further isolated, facing some sort of otherworldly judgment. This allusion to Matatsuki in the afterlife won't be the last, and there are several interpretations of her death and or damnation. If we return to Number World and travel southeast, we discover another door tucked into an alcove. Binary digits, ones and zeros, cover the floor of the foyer. Beyond lies the ambient glow of Lamp World. Unlike the harsh contrasts or jarring visuals of other worlds, this place exudes a melancholic serenity. Rows upon rows of slender streetlights stretch into the distance, some on and some off, perhaps alluded to at the threshold as binary digits typically refer to on and off states. Among the lamp poles to the east, the player discovers the walking lamp. When interacted with, Matatsuki receives the lamp effect, which allows her to illuminate dark areas. If we travel north of the walking lamp, we discover one street lamp that is shorter than all the others. Interacting, we are transported to an island on the checkered tile path where we discover another cabinet. We can see a figure tucked inside, obscured behind our figure. If we use the severed head effect, we can more closely see the figure. It's us. We are inside the cabinet. What could this mean? We've seen evidence of Matatsuki's retreat from the world, shrinking her life smaller and smaller for something more manageable. However, as evidenced from the guillotine world, Matatsuki does not find solace in hiding inside the cabinets. Most of these contain scary faces terrifying her. Could this be evidence of her symbolic death, hiding in the cabinets to escape from the bullying, compelled to isolate, but riddled with self-loathing for her compulsion? Could it be a reflection of her feelings about being a hikikomori? With nothing further to do, we retreat back to Number World for one final exploration, and it's a dark one. A series of number nines on the floor lead to the easternmost alcove, where there's a wall with a single zipper tile face. This section will appear differently in some dreams, one with a green line for a mouth and the other with a white mouth. These faces are randomly assigned when first entering the dream, 
The doorway is seemingly impassable, the zipper zipped tight. However, there is a way forward, only the path might not be the one you're prepared to tread, at least not yet. After opening the zipper, we travel inside and follow a long isolated walkway until we encounter QQ. The figure rubs the banister back and forth with a demented and unwavering smile. Some claim the character was nicknamed by players as an onomatopoeia for the squeaking noises made by the rubbing of the banister. However, the name is more official than this. The game files for these noises have the following titles. This translates to Q1 and Q2, which means that QQ is actually an official moniker. It's also worth noting that this gives significance to the number nines which led to the hidden world, because in Japanese, the number nine is pronounced and spelled Q. QQ is a significant cornerstone for many leading theories about Yume Nikki. The phallic figure, red and veined, hiding behind a zipper, the stroking motion on the banister, many have implied this is a symbol of some sexual trauma experienced by Maratsuki, perhaps the very trauma that drove her to become a hikikomori. Further supporting this theory is the door appearing beyond QQ. It's the same as the door of Maratsuki's room. Entering this door reveals the face event, a strobing, disturbing animation that seems to indicate extreme emotion or duress. Confronting this event, Maratsuki immediately wakes in her bedroom. While the contours of this theory are compelling, we must gather more threads of evidence before weaving them into a cohesive narrative. And with that, we leave behind Number World. The shadows of Dark World are so dense they seem to swallow everything, turning the landscape into an almost impenetrable void. But as with many things in Maratsuki's dreams, appearances can be deceiving. With the aid of the lamp effect, the world is transformed, revealing intricate patterns reminiscent of Aztec or Paracas-styled art. These patterns guide the player through the enveloping darkness. What lies within this shadowy expanse? The kitchen knife, a pivotal tool for Maratsuki, can be discovered nestled between two hand-like patterns at the map's center. The kitchen knife drives entities away in fear. It can be used to slaughter them, clearing a path forward. An archway nearby serves as a portal to transport Maratsuki to the wilderness. The wilderness is a stark contrast to the obsidian of Dark World. The landscape is a stretch of beige sand punctuated by brambles and rocks. This is one of the largest areas in the game, sprawling through multiple sections. Westward, upbeat and celebratory music plays and continuing through the trailhead, we uncover the Torningen party. Picnic blankets and snacks spread among the ruins while a boombox surges with marimbas. Furthering themes of isolation and ostracization, vegetation blocks the path forward, preventing Maratsuki from joining the party. With nothing left to see, we head eastward to encounter a larger set of ruins, an overturned, hollow totem head reveals a bizarre cutscene of the Aztec monkey previously seen in the forest world. Many have speculated about the purpose of the Nazcan or Paracas styled art. These are ancient cultures of South America. Could it be that Maratsuki or the developer, Kikiyama, have a connection to these cultures through heritage? Or is it purely an aesthetic choice, relating back to strange and historical symbols that appear alien in modern context? A green fence encircles an abandoned settlement to the north, where strange creatures wander the road, 
An entity here will transport the player to a two-dimensional world with graphics similar to Manatsuki's Famicom. After navigating another Byzantine maze, we acquire the squish squish effect, which only serves to change our appearance. We return to explore one last area, the infinite wilderness. Like other worlds, this section loops endlessly. To the southwest, we encounter an anthropomorphized towel, which provides the towel effect. Again, this provides little more than a change in Manatsuki's appearance. If we travel to the north, there's a corridor of plants that act as a gateway to the staircase in the sky, a set of temple-like steps that continue almost endlessly upward. The gradient of the sky slowly transitions from blue to green as we climb in elevation. At the top lies the Sky Garden. Three green men are gathered at the cliffside watching a UFO dart against the backdrop of a real photograph. The silent observers fix their gaze to the distance. This will not be the only time we encounter extraterrestrial life. Within the brick building nearby lies Ghost World, a drab and stark location dotted with concrete buildings. It's a dark maze, devoid of color, and it's the second world traversed by Maratsuki that echoes tones of the afterlife. Ghost World is populated only by three strange and chromosomal entities. While the world seems devoid of purpose or meaning, the player encounters a ghost to the east, which provides the spirit headband effect. This effect turns Maratsuki into a ghost, making her invisible to other characters. One thing seems clear, Maratsuki's ruminations on the afterlife seem omnipresent. Dark World, The Wilderness, and Ghost World. These are a triptych of Maratsuki's lostness. She pressed forward through the dark, pushing when there appeared to be no path forward, and yet the only useful ability that she acquired was one that seemingly simulates her afterlife, a spectral echo of her existence. The ground of Puddle World is dark, except for a mosaic of pooling water mirroring a moonlit sky, creating an almost ethereal atmosphere. The landscape is empty, no loud colors or alien life, only a few streetlights to punctuate the quietude. Southeast, we discover the umbrella effect, which causes a downpour when activated. A pink staircase here leads to the dense woods, where the pathing is constricted, squeezing through overgrown foliage, and the only way forward is a narrow, two-lane road that grimly ends at the lifeless body of a pedestrian cordoned off by traffic cones. Interacting with this tragic scene bestows the traffic light effect, morphing Maratsuki into its likeness and granting her the power to toggle between green and red signals stopping the world around her. Further north, an unsealed manhole draws us deeper. We climb down the tentacles of a disturbing red creature, disfigured and surreal, and we emerge into a white desert with cacti and totems. The path forward leads to an encounter with the thing with the quivering jaw. The colossal entity is menacing, and many find it frightening due to its deformed body and grinding teeth. It's worth noting that the color scheme and composition of this scene mirrors one we have already encountered, Uboa's Trap. There's another section of the dense woods that is only accessible by teleporting through hell. This section quickly becomes darkened presumably shadowed by the canopy of tree growth. While the lamp effect allows the player to illuminate the path forward, it also reveals eyes within the forest that watch as she travels onward. 
Our path ends at a lone train car with a single occupant. This train leads to Witch's Island, where three entities, pale and faceless, echo the Naparabo, faceless ghosts from Japanese folklore. Unlike Yukiona, these creatures do not typically harm humans, and instead, they are only meant to frighten those nearby. The player must traverse another boardwalk across a watery expanse. This waterway contains strange purple monuments, and further onward, a drowning man thrashing against the surface. Matatsuki reaches another island and acquires the witch effect after interacting with what appears to be a haunted tree. The use of the witch effect causes Matatsuki to don a witch's costume and board a hovering broom. The acquisition of this effect concludes the exploration of Witch's Island and the larger Puddle World. Hidden within a dreamscape of reflection, the deceased pedestrian and island of outcasts could be reflections of some traumatic event from Maratsuki's past and her subsequent self-isolation. The desolate block world contains clusters of abstract geometric shapes. Near the center of the map, the hat and scarf effect can be found nestled between two pink bricks, another effect that only serves to alter Maratsuki's appearance. An invisible entity to the east wears the same hat and scarf, and using the traffic light, we can make her visible. Interacting with this entity teleports Matatsuki to different areas of Block World, one of which being the Black Gateway, which is the doorway to the White Desert. We have previously explored sections of the White Desert during Uboa's trap and the thing with the quivering jaw, yet we have not encountered this empty expanse. It's a blank canvas, vast and isolating with hand-drawn structures and entities punctuating the barren landscape. Venturing northward, a tunnel emerges, and inside we uncover Monaco, or Monochromatic Girl, a name derived from her in-game file title. At first, she appears ordinary, but the traffic light effect unveils a haunting transformation. She becomes disfigured, her form contorting to sprout additional limbs revealing a gaping wound in her chest. This grotesque metamorphosis becomes even more pronounced upon closer interaction. Deciphering the symbolism of Monaco's transformation is a challenge. Some theorize that the White Desert's aesthetic draws inspiration from early horror manga, reminiscent of Junji Ito, and the body horror elements might be a nod to this unsettling genre. Others postulate that the traffic light's influence on Monaco's transformation might hint at a traumatic memory, possibly another traffic accident, echoing the circumstances where the effect was first obtained. A similar event awaits in a tunnel to the south, where we encounter another monochromatic girl, Mono, also named from her in-game file title. Unlike Monaco, Mono appears unscathed and demure. Monaco and Mono appear to be Aristotelian opposites, their similarities in appearance, name, and location clashing with the stark contrast of their transformations during interaction. It's led some to speculate the two are related, siblings, perhaps even twins, yet their contrasting presentations one grotesquely disfigured and the other eerily passive, might symbolize two different facets of loss, Monaco representing the sudden violent nature of trauma and Mono representing a more gradual, lingering loss. If we enter the other end of this tunnel, we stray beyond the walls of the white desert. We can see red tubes that resemble those that took us to the thing with the quivering jaw. The landscape is unsettling. Motionless flames burn on the horizon and large limbs jut from the landscape. At the end of this path is a small room that once entered 
reveals a decapitated head in the sky. The recurring theme of bodily harm and vehicular trauma is hard to ignore. The traffic light effect, Monaco's transformation, and now this severed head. Delving deeper into the game files, some have unearthed remnants of a scrapped Famicom game titled Severed Head PK, which was planned in version .04. It was a macabre soccer game, played with decapitated heads. This draws another parallel with ancient South American cultures, as a prominent sport at the time was Pocatoke, where it's speculated that severed heads were used as balls. It's clear that the white desert is a place of loss. It's bereft of color and filled with horror, hinting at some deeper truth just out of reach. The stark landscape of Uboa's trap, the surreal portrait of the thing with the quivering jaw, and the brutal transformation of Monaco imply that we are exploring a dream on the cusp of a nightmare, weighty with grief. It's something eagerly left behind. Mural World contains fluorescent blue and yellow tapestries of Paracas-styled art. These murals are juxtaposed with the presence of unsettling blob monsters patrolling near ominous blood splatters. These creatures appear menacing, gnashing their teeth, but they provide the long hair and blonde hair effects, which only serve to change Matatsuki's appearance. A manhole to the east leads to a subterranean sewer system. Descending, we traverse a long runoff tunnel before emerging near an underground city. Its inhabitants wander aimlessly through the water. The journey continues into another tunnel, a sewage processing plant with walls punctuated by gaps that reveal bizarre black and white images, grotesque and distorted. These images, with their unsettling deformities, might be a manifestation of Matatsuki's internal struggles with body dysmorphia, or perhaps related to the traumatic experiences alluded to with the appearance of Monaco. We end our exploration in the final sewage processing room, where we encounter a faceless ghost. This entity provides the faceless effect, further deepening the enigma of Matatsuki's identity and self-perception. Adopting the appearance of a Naparabo suggests a loss of self, an erasure of her identity. As previously mentioned, these Naparabo exist only to scare or startle the living. Mural World and its sewers offer a momentary respite from the chaotic and harrowing worlds already traversed. It's bizarre that the bright, artistic topside would be paired with such an ugly underbelly that this domain would house multiple effects to alter Matatsuki's appearance, some enhancing her traditional femininity, while others distorting or erasing it. Due to the implication of sexual trauma with QQ, perhaps Matatsuki associates aspects of her femininity as the cause of her victimization. Beneath the long hair or the blonde hair lies someone who may have been erased. The enigmatic graffiti world is covered in vibrant, swirling tiles that have the appearance of street art. The chaos of colors and shapes seem as random as anything else in the dreamscape of Matatsuki. But if we adopt a grander perspective, a pattern emerges. It's another Paracas-styled monkey, and this design choice seems emblematic of one of the game's themes. What appears random or illogical is only the result of our restricted perspective. We hope that much of our questions about Matatsuki her tragic past and the cause of her isolation are questions that will be answered as we broaden our perspective 
by exploring her dreams. The bicycle effect awaits to the northeast, a tool that enhances our mobility and speed. Nearby, an elevator and escalator transport us to what is commonly referred to as the mall, where several rooms await exploration. One is occupied by a torning gin behind a desk and a man seated at a couch. Peculiar posters adorn the walls, and in the neighboring room, another man plays an upbeat tune. On the floor, we encounter the flute effect, which allows Maratsuki to play various jingles. Another room in the mall houses a more unsettling sight, a geometric entity reminiscent of a Salvador Dali painting spilling out red liquid. Perhaps the mall is a misnomer for this location. Some theorize it's more akin to a hospital. The artwork found here appears to resemble anatomical and even sexually suggestive diagrams like this which appears to be the fertilization of an egg cell, the presence of what seems to be a nurse, a sneezing patient, and a music therapist further cement this connection. If we consider this world within the framework of our other theories, could the hospital represent Maratsuki's healing journey after some vehicular accident, or could it be the place where she healed and attempted to cope with some sort of sexual trauma? The music therapy, coupled with the suggestive diagrams, might be indicative of a therapeutic approach to address post-traumatic stress. Graffiti world and the mall within, they leave us to ponder the puzzles of Maratsuki's pain as we continue to trace the outlines of a narrative as fragmented as the dreamscapes that house them. Eyeball World is a gallery of the macabre. The terrain is stark, an expanse littered with eyeballs and disembodied limbs. The world furthers the body horror themes encountered in the white desert, perhaps another veiled allusion to a traffic accident. Legs hop in the dark and hands clench at the sky, a grotesque ballet. One of these hands contains an eyeball in its palm providing another effect, one that allows the player to return to the Nexus without waking from the dream. This domain, at first glance, might seem like reiterations of familiar themes, yet as we delve deeper, we uncover harrowing echoes of Monaco and Mono, these ghostly faces with expressions etched in anguish. These same faces appear elsewhere, marred by bleeding features, the recurring imagery of dismemberment speaks to themes of violation and fragmentation, perhaps echoing her body dysmorphia, features and limbs that appear monstrous and terrifying when separated and isolated from the body as a whole. Are these representations of unwanted sexualization, eyes watching and hands grabbing? Lastly, could they be reflections on the aftermath of a violent trauma like a traffic accident, forever imprinted on her mind. Eyeball World, with its sparse population and enigmatic imagery, can leave players feeling adrift, attempting to decipher a jigsaw with missing pieces. It's a digital confrontation of death that compels us to look deeper, to search for meaning in the void, and to confront the uncomfortable reality that the most haunting demons are the ones we carry within us. Candle World is a wash in the wavering glow of small flames. A dwarf patrols this map, and we encounter him near a purple pyramid. If we use the traffic light, we can freeze the figure and acquire another effect, which transforms Maratsuki into one or multiple smaller versions of herself. As in Snow World, we encounter another bed, beckoning us to chase a dream within a dream, and we are transported 
to the stairway of hands, a staircase flanked by distorted and elongated arms reaching from unseen depths. Outstretched and grasping, these hands seem to imply that something has been buried or sublimated and it's trying to take hold of us now. Below awaits the underworld, an industrial space reminiscent of a parking garage. One of these hallways houses a blazing inferno that can be doused with the umbrella effect. Within this storage room, we encounter another gnashing mouth monster that provides the poo hair effect, which transforms Manatsuki's appearance to something equally comical and degrading. A door at the back of the storage room leads to a monochromatic and futuristic foyer. Stars are visible in the windows overhead, and Maratsuki progresses to discover the control room of what appears to be a spaceship. A monochromatic man stands in a black jumpsuit in front of a synthesizer. Similar to many of the other characters we've encountered, he serves as a beacon of loneliness and isolation, trapped in this barren room, adrift among the stars. The small flames that dot Candle World and the many stars dotting the view outside the spaceship, they seem to communicate that Maratsuki is just as trapped and isolated in her dreams as she is outside of them, adrift in her own vast internal world, one that is close to concluding. Shield Folk World is home to large fluorescent beings that wield primitive shields and weapons. Their presence and the paracas inspired floor art are eerily similar to Mural World, a gallery of indigenous influence. Among a group of red entities is a rotating token of a cat's head, which provides the cat effect, transforming Maratsuki into a feline. This effect has the ability to draw entities closer. A nearby gateway leads to an invisible maze, only occasionally interrupted with flashes of static. The path forward is a blind journey, a reflection of her inner turmoil, her feelings of being trapped within her trauma and striving to escape. We emerge in another pixelated world with aesthetics similar to Maratsuki's Famicom. This transition, while jarring, reinforces the notion that Maratsuki's dreams are anchored in her real-world experiences, but this seemingly innocuous reference carries a more ominous undertone, lending credence to theories that suggest her dreams might be autobiographical recollections of trauma. This journey culminates in a dense woodland where a quaint cottage awaits. Inside, a maze of staircases unfolds within an office-like setting. In the basement of this house waits the Oni effect, which transforms Maratsuki into a demon. Her skin turned crimson, and sharp horns protruding from her head. And so we have acquired all 24 effects, and we return to the Nexus, where we drop the effects one by one, and upon waking, Maratsuki's room appears unchanged. There is one difference, however. The balcony. The final scene of Yume Nikki is Maratsuki leaping from the balcony and plummeting off screen. It fades to black only revealing a hauntingly serene image of her splattered remains on the pavement. She has finally escaped her isolation in the only way she felt she could.
Yume Nikki is a haunting and complex odyssey. With its conclusion, we stand at the precipice of interpretation, looking back at a story that defies conventional explanation. Its symbolic density make it a digital Rorschach test, an intricate imprint that each player translates into a narrative that is uniquely their own. Yume Nikki isn't only a shared story, it's a reflection of the individual who plays it. Many have been compelled to assemble common threads and build prevailing theories that aim to unravel the game's deeper meaning. It's clear that Matatsuki is profoundly isolated, a hikikomori who refuses to interact with the outside world. It is highly likely that this self-isolation has a point of origin, a traumatic event that drove her to withdraw. So she retreats inward and turns to her dreams for escape. But even here, she begins to encounter disturbing yet ciphered imagery that hints at her trauma. One of the leading theories points to a sexually traumatic event. In Number World, we opened a zipper in the wall and encountered QQ, an entity that closely resembles a phallic symbol. This entity strokes the banister, a simulation that furthers this implication. Beyond QQ, we must pass through the same door of Maratsuki's room, which implies that whatever trauma Maratsuki had encountered, she encountered it outside of her apartment. Immediately following this interaction, we encounter a bizarre full-screen event and are forced awake, as if from a nightmare. In the hospital, we encountered figures trapped in the throes of their own traumatic recovery. Some seem to be pursuing musical therapy to heal in the aftermath of unspeakable events. Music therapy is often a prescribed treatment modality for sexual trauma, especially for those who struggle to communicate or connect, as may be the case with the hikikomori. These musical therapy approaches can be the learning and performing of a new instrument, such as the flute, as a means of nonverbal expression and catharsis, or it can be listening to musical performances to talk about emotion and meaning as interpretation. The aftermath of this type of trauma can be fractured and unsettling. Maratsuki may displace blame or internalize it. Many of the appearance-altering effects that represent traditionally feminine characteristics are possessed by hideous and monstrous creatures. Conversely, her self-image may be drastically altered. She may have displaced the cause of her isolation as a result of her physical appearance, developing unhealthy fixations on perceived faults, leading to body dysmorphia. This is represented by several other appearance-altering effects. Additionally, her distorted perceptions on the human body may be reflected externally as well. The disambiguated limbs and features of some worlds, the bizarre and surreal entities, they may all be the result of a fractured sense of her physical self. The distorted bodies, disparaging effects and disturbing conclusion, they suggest that her narrative was one of coping, comprehension, and surrender. Another leading theory about the traumatic event that caused Maratsuki's isolation involves the traffic accident in the dense woods. We encountered the corpse of a figure in the middle of a road, implying that this person died as the result of reckless driving. When examined closely, a bone can be seen jutting from the left arm. This figure provides the traffic light effect which allows Maratsuki to pause entities with the use of the red light. This could be wish fulfillment, the desire to have the power to prevent this accident, to have stopped the assaulting vehicle with a red light. Other figures have bizarre and distorted reactions to the traffic light. For example, Monaco becomes disfigured, sharing even the broken arm of the figure in the dense woods. As a result, the body horrors encountered may be a reflection of what she witnessed during a vehicular accident, and the hospital may have been a place of recovery after physical trauma. While this theory may be compelling, it provides few answers for the inquisitive player. 
These leading theories attempt to understand Yume Nikki through a dark lens, a haunting surrender to her suffering and trauma. But what if this journey is a quest for self-understanding, a symbolic confrontation and integration of the fragmented aspects of her identity, psyche, and experience. This self-transformation shares many connections with the Tibetan Book of the Dead, an ancient spiritual text that delves into the liminal space between death and rebirth, where souls grapple with their karma, the totality of their actions during their life. During this transitional state, individuals would become unmoored from the natural world forced to undergo profound introspection as they confront personifications of their past actions, both benevolent and malevolent. They can unshackle themselves from past trauma, their desires and aversions accrued over a lifetime, and through this process, their soul was offered a chance for reflection, reconciliation, and eventual release. Tibetan Buddhist practitioners even believed that dreams served as a preparatory stage for the inevitable journey after death. It's a realm where the living can, in essence, rehearse for the afterlife. With this lens, we may interpret Yume Nikki as the acceptance and surrender of her past life and her final act as one of letting go and achieving rebirth or nirvana. Yume Nikki defies singular interpretation, the game's intricate symbolism, and deliberately vague storyline, invite players to project their own memories, anxieties, and beliefs, creating a unique personal experience for each player. Its core essence remains shrouded in mystery, but this very obscurity empowers players to forge their own narratives. This capacity for personal connection, where each player can imbue and extract their own meaning, might be the reason behind its cult fandom. There remains one other fragmented narrative left to uncover. The story of the reclusive developer, Kikiyama. Kikiyama hosted Yume Nikki on a vector page, and a link was uploaded to 2Channel a Japanese equivalent of 4chan. The enigmatic developer has an almost non-existent online footprint outside of a rudimentary website and minimal email communication with the player base. As little as we know about Yume Nikki, we know even less about Kikiyama. However, this hasn't stopped fans from speculating. It's likely that Japanese is Kikiyama's first language, as evidenced by the game's initial language on release. It may be likely that they are of Peruvian Japanese descent due to the many references to Paracas-styled art. Many have speculated that Kikiyama is a man due to the game's initial posting on 2Channel. However, they have consistently used non-binary pronouns perhaps a linguistic convention of the native language. A readme file in an early version of the game contained sparse update notes and an email address by which Kikiyama could be contacted. This address is still active, and while many have sent email to Kikiyama over the years, only a few have received responses. The game was incrementally updated until 2007 with the release of Build 0.10, after which, the website went unattended, and the game saw no further updates. It was rumored that Kikiyama last responded to an email in 2011, shortly before the deadly Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. On March 11th, the fourth most powerful earthquake ever recorded occurred off the east coast of Japan. A tsunami with waves over 100 feet crashed into the coast minutes later. The destruction was cataclysmic, and the event claimed nearly 20,000 lives. Many worried that Kikiyama was tallied among them. Others still began to theorize about the connections between Maratsuki and Kikiyama with such a deeply personal storyline filled with themes of isolation, trauma, and death. They speculated that Kikiyama 
may have committed the same final act as Maratsuki. And this speculation continued for years, that is, until 2018. Build 0.10 appeared on the Steam platform where it could be freely downloaded. The publisher, Playism, and the developer, Katakawa Games, teased a new Yume Nikki game, and they released a statement that Kikiyama was involved in the development. Alongside this update, a timer appeared on Kikiyama's website. This confirmed that Kikiyama was not only alive, but actively participating in the development of another Yume Nikki installment. Later, in 2023, a strange interview with Kikiyama surfaced. The interviewer was Toby Fox, the game developer responsible for the indie hit Undertale. Fox has previously cited Yume Nikki as a strong artistic influence, even creating a character inspired by Uboa. The interview was peculiarly formatted into 10 yes or no questions, many of which did little to shed light on the mysteries of Yume Nikki. However, some clarity was gained from this interview. Kikiyama confirmed that this was not meant to be the final release of the game, that the art was originally illustrated, and that Kikiyama's reticent and reclusive nature has not relaxed in the 20 years since release. With the conclusion of Yume Nikki, many questions are left unanswered. And it's in the game's silent departure that the echo of our interpretations begin to resonate louder. It's a haunting invitation to look deeper within ourselves and question, what are the demons we carry with us and how have we hidden them from ourselves and the world? As the screen finally fades to black, we're left with a lingering sense of unease, the kind that only comes with a story that is far from over a story that perhaps was never meant to be fully understood at all and only deeply felt. <laughs>